In Matthew 9, 37, Jesus says to his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Today is the day when that fits what's going on in the Rocky Mountain District. The fields are white unto harvest. Is it possible that you could be the answer? According to the CDC, in 2022, nearly 110,000 people died of drug overdose in the U.S. alone. That could have been me. I'm a pastor's son, raised in a pastor's home with the greatest options that a kid could have ever been given. But even in that great environment, I lost my way and found myself addicted to heroin and crack cocaine. I graduated Lifeline Connect in 2014, and now, I have my family back. I almost lost them. I'm involved in the recovery ministry, and my heart is to pull other people out of the fire. Over the course of a year, I take hundreds of calls from pastors and family members of men that are trapped in the throes of addiction. We want to be that resource for you, a resource that you can send men to get help that need residential treatment. A voice spoke to me and said, I've got something I want to show you. I was so sure God had talked to me. And I was stunned by what I saw. A direct fulfillment of this over 2,500-year-old prophecy. The United States will stand with Israel. Why haven't I ever seen this before? One third of humanity will die. What do these beasts symbolize? The lion, the bear, the leopard. The combined beast from Revelation 13 represents the end time government of the Antichrist. Understanding the end time. I'm Dr. Braden Anderson, an evangelist with the United Pentecostal Church, and I want to tell you about the Jesus Tent Revival. This started a few years ago in Kokomo, Indiana, when Pastor and Sister Bobby Carter gave us a call and invited us to come out to be part of their vision. They put a tent up on their land with the goal of having people come and hear exclusively about Jesus, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. And year after year since that time, it has been an increasing exponential revival. We have invested in this vision that they had and want to see it move across the United States. We have two tents. One is uh, would seat about 250 to 300 people and one could seat literally over a thousand people. We want to use these in different churches and sections and districts all across the United States. If you're planning your year's big outreach event, please give us a call and let's be involved with you in your goal in reaching the lost and having revival in your region. Matthew 6.20 tells us to lay up our treasures in heaven. When you invest with the United Pentecostal Church Loan Fund, you are investing in the kingdom. Your investment enables us to offer financing opportunities to growing churches all across the United States. We have many investment types and terms to choose from. We have standard certificates, month-to-month kingdom impact account, individual retirement accounts, and even Coverdell Education Savings Accounts. You can choose between one, three, or five-year terms. Right now, we are offering a general conference investment special. Any new or current investor can receive a 0.25% interest rate bump when you open a new investment. Apply before October 31st and make sure you mention GC Special to receive this special offer. To see our rates and find out more, visit our website or give us a call today. You can also visit the Stewardship Group booth here at General Conference.
Believers Travel, helping dreams happen. Have you ever wanted to walk where Jesus walked? Experience the steps of Paul's missionary journey. Be where John baptized and recorded the book of Revelation. Believers Travel is the largest and most experienced pilgrimage travel company in our movement. We can bring you to Israel, to Greece, to Turkey, to Italy, and Egypt. Let us help you and your church have these life-changing experiences. A better trip, a better price, and a better experience. Believers Travel is here to serve you and your church. Believers Travel, delivering the experience of a lifetime. Are you bilingual? Missionaries and ministries need your help. The vision of NTS is to create an apostolic library in every language, as we've done in French with 100 published books. We also want to facilitate interpreting. Join our network of interpreters, translators, and revisers to participate in this powerful ministry or to explore training options. Stop by our booth for your free gift and visit nonprofittranslation.org. As the journey begins, the destination is clear. But what bridge do we take to get there? And what happens along the way? Since 1949, the gospel has been our foundation and blueprint for the present and future of the first accredited Oneness Pentecostal College. The journey is far from over, but it must start somewhere. CLC. to tell you it's worth it those that will lose are those who refuse to accept the call of God I'm talking to the 40 year old version of you if you walk out on the call of God now you'll still be 20 years down the road wishing you would not have you might live in a multi-million dollar home, but you'll lay your head to a satin pillow every night wishing you could get back to the crossroads when you were trying to decide whether you would follow the call of God or the call of the world. Kevin, what if no one ever even knows my name? Yeah, but what if your whole city knows his? Hi, my name is Rachel Sines, and I attend North Texas Christian College, where we are to educate, empower, and evangelize. As a young person and as a minister, I felt the need to go to the next level and to progress as a saint, and NTCC empowered me to go that extra step. My education at NTCC has allowed me to not only bring biblical truth to those around me, but also to strengthen the hands and the hearts of those in my local assembly through my preaching. We know that in the United Pentecostal Church International, 70 to 80% of our ministers are bivocational. Just one of the five degrees is a business degree. So a student can essentially get apostolic doctrine and theology and then transfer and get a degree, accredited degree in business. So if you're interested in an apostolic education, register now at ntchristian.college.
Jason Rincon. By the grace of God, we serve as regional missionaries in Guangzhou, China for almost nine years. Uh, for security reasons, we needed to go out, so we are now in Tampa, Florida, serving God under the leadership of Pastor Robert Teasdale. Because of our background in logistics, business administration, and language, because we can speak the Chinese language, we are selling products for churches, LED screens, sound systems, and chairs for churches. We are involved in the production process, logistics, as uh, transportation and shipping, and also installation and after sales. We are doing all in one company. We are ready to help you and bless you because we are kingdom minded. Due to the nature of the subject matter, or perhaps you feel a little uncomfortable in addressing moral purity with the church or individuals, or perhaps you lack the resources or knowledge in offering practical insight in helping people to overcome addiction, check out AMP, Apostolic Moral Purity. It might be the resource that you are looking for. In the last year, we have had over 20 ladies come through our support and recovery groups. And I have personally witnessed tremendous healing and growth take place in many of these ladies' lives. And while we're saddened by the circumstances that bring these ladies our way, we are so grateful that we have a place that they can come and receive the support and the help and healing that they need. No matter the size of gift, once put in the hands of God, it can multiply. Planting a seed is simple. If you are a UPCI church, college, or ministry, consider opening an endowment fund to help support your needs. We can also aid in marketing to your church and donors on specific giving options. As a household, consider setting up a charitable trust or annuity that gives you income for life while blessing a ministry in the end. For more information, visit us at the Stewardship Booth. for prayer. How many of you believe that God is giving us great harvest? Amen. I was in a well-known denominational mega church recently for a family event, and I was on the agenda to share something prior to the bishop of this church who was coming up for a few minutes after me to speak. God opened the door in which, in which I appealed to everyone about obeying Acts 2.38. To everyone's surprise, when the bishop came up after me to the podium to speak, he shared that minutes before that I had even mentioned Acts 2.38, that God was dealing with him while he was sitting in the pulpit the whole time for him to tell the audience about Acts 2.38. And he didn't know why God was telling him that, but over and over again, he felt that so strongly. Then the bishop told the audience when he heard me speak before him that God had confirmed it, then the bishop literally told this denominational non-apostolic church that we all need to obey Acts 2.38. Wow! Later after the event, some people commented, why did the bishop say that? This church does not even believe that. But I'm going to tell you tonight why the bishop said that. It's because God is moving upon the hearts of those who are hungry, including pastors and leaders of whole churches. And I believe there is a great harvest of revival and restoration and pastors and whole churches are going to come into apostolic truth. Do you believe that? Because we're in the last days and in the end time harvest and the end game is the harvest. At this time, I would like evangelists 
Harris, uh, Doug Klein Dance, uh, to come to the podium and lead us in prayer tonight on the harvest. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's prayer time. Would you join us? On that hill far away, there once stood an old rugged cross. The shed blood of Jesus became redemption for a lost world. It was that cross, it was that blood, it was that incredible sacrifice that bears witness to you and I tonight that God so loved the world. He suffered because he loved. He gave because he loved. He died because he loved. The lost are the sacred trust of this church. Mercy's great, grace is free. No one's too lost. No one's too bound. No one, no chains of hell are too strong. No sin is too great. No devil is undefeatable. Though millions have come, there's still room tonight. We've got to preach this gospel. We've got to preach it everywhere. We've got to pray always. We've got to pray with a fervent passion. Come on, church, let's pray tonight, wherever you are. Start praying even right now. We need the end time intercessors to rise up. Intercessors arise all over this house. Break the chains of darkness. We must set the captives free. Pray for someone lost right now. Pray for your lost loved ones. Call their names in this atmosphere of prayer. Call the names of backsliders right now as you pray. Call the names of those addicted to drugs and prescription medications. We're praying. We're praying to set the captives free from mental illness, emotional instability, the incarcerated and those that are behind bars. We pray for you tonight. We bring your case before the throne of heaven. We intercede on your behalf to every demonically oppressed soul. We loose you through prayers of intercession. Those that are bound in false religions, we speak you are free as we pray for you right now. Pray for lost children. Pray for lost youth. Pray for lost teenagers. Pray for lost families. Pray for the lost and the lonely senior citizens. Come on, church. We're moving into the end time. We've got to pray. We're moving into prophetic fulfillment. We've got to pray. Lift your voice all the way back there to the risers. Lift your voice in prayers of intercession. We've got to grow. We've got to evangelize. This gospel's got to go everywhere. We've got to multiply. The harvest is plenteous. Pray that the Lord will send laborers. We pray right now as a unified body. Lord, send laborers into the harvest. Raise up the five-fold ministry of apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and send us with anointing and fresh power into the harvest field to bring the lost. Come on, we need to pray passionately. We need to pray with great burden. We need to pray with deep concern. Lift your voice with the person beside you. What kind of service could we have tonight if we lose this atmosphere in prayer right now? What's gonna happen in North America and around the world when a mighty army of prayer warriors lift their voice? I'm asking every single person in this auditorium right now to lift your voice and cry out. Lift your voice of prayer and faith. Intercessors, I'm calling on you right now. Cry out. This is your moment. This is an unstructured, unplanned moment. Cry out, intercessors. Cry out in intercessory prayer. Cry out, spiritual warriors. Cry out from the deep place of your soul. Speak with other tongues as the Spirit flows through you. All the way over here to my left, let your voice be heard. All the way to the right, 
I lose spiritual authority on you right now to pray the prayer of faith. Let the passionate, fervent prayer of deliverance ring in this auditorium right now. Come on, we've only got a few minutes. We've got to make it count. For the next few minutes, I boldly declare that this auditorium is a house of prayer. Pray, pray. Grab the hand of the person beside you. Put your hand on their shoulder. Get together and begin to rock and pray. On the platform, let's take it up a notch. We need to pray those intercessory prayers, those warring prayers for the harvest to come forth at harvest time. Multiply us, Lord. You're about to reap the great harvest at our hands. Send out labors. Let laborers go forth into the harvest. I pray over every local church. I pray over every pastor. I pray over every mission field. Lord, let us reap the harvest. I say to the north, give up. To the south, hold not back. East and west, bring our sons and daughters from afar. Come on, folks. Some of them are going to be your family. Some of them are going to be your backsliders. Some of them are going to be people that you've prayed for for years. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming out of every denomination. They're coming out of every religion. They're coming out of every culture. But they're coming bound. They're coming lost. They're coming blind. But there's no millions have already come. There's still room at the old rugged cross tonight. Can you see your loved one coming? Can you see them coming down the dusty road headed toward this city of refuge? Come on, pray for them. They're coming. Call their name right now. They're coming. God, we pray that the remainder of this general conference would endue us with such power. I lose apostolic authority and the prophetic anointing upon this United Pentecostal Church conference tonight. For the next two minutes, would you pray in the Holy Ghost? For the next two minutes, would you close your eyes and pray in other tongues? There are deep prayers of intercession. There are deep prayers of intercession that are coming all over this building. I feel some intercessory prayer in the risers tonight. Hey, Aloha. Hey, Aloha Sahib. Our team has to go off the platform, but we're going to continue on a few minutes here. We have about four more minutes. Team, I wonder if you'd come down here in the front now. Come down here in the front now and keep praying. Just come around the corner and walk across this front. What a mighty anointing is in this house. My brothers and sisters, this is an extremely important service tonight. Tonight, we are going to hear the ministry of our general superintendent and we need to pray for him. We need the mighty anointing of God to be heavy in this auditorium. We need him to be strong and he needs our support in prayer. He's gonna need our support in preaching. He's going to need our support through this service. So we're going to take these last two minutes, and I'm asking every voice in this place, if you would call the name and begin to pray over the ministry of our general superintendent tonight. I promised him we would pray fervently for his physical strength. Pray for him to be physically strong. We pray for the physical strength of our general superintendent, David K. Bernard. We ask you, Lord, to strengthen him physically in his body right now.
give him strength that only comes from the Lord. I ask you to loose him. Loose him to speak boldly to us tonight. Loose our general superintendent to speak to us with direction tonight. Let the anointing be so heavily upon him that he ministers beyond himself. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us a heart to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church through our leader tonight. Descend on us with power and demonstration. I'm asking you right now if you can reach way down deep inside one more time. And with a passionate, fervent, anointed prayer, every single hand raised, every single voice lifted, pray for this service. Lord, for every one of these musicians, every one of these singers, everybody that will have any portion of the service tonight, we pray for a mighty, holy, glorious anointing of the Holy Ghost. Pray for the anointing, church. Pray for an anointing and a divine visitation of the Holy Ghost. Pray for a divine visitation of the Holy Ghost to be upon us right now. Anoint our superintendent, anoint our preacher tonight. Let him speak boldly. Let him speak with clarity. Put your words in his mouth, we pray. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, with one last unified orchestrated voice, would you shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Create an atmosphere. Create an atmosphere. This is the apostolic church. I'll never give up to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus on earth alone, to be like Him, and all through life's journey from earth to
in the house. Let's worship the Lord with a little bit of Southern Gospel style here now. Come on. Go. I am looking for the day when I see Jesus and his blessed face I shall behold. Pray the saints of old, the half of them be told when my feet touch the streets of the streets of glory when I travel my last weary mile will he hold my trembling hand when before the bar I stand will he say my child well done a crown of life you now have won when my feet touch the streets of gold now my chance some happy morning you should miss me oh, well don't you weep for me because I'm gone I'll be at the feet of the one who died for me When my feet touch the streets of God When my feet touch the streets of glory When I travel my last weary mile Will he hold my trembling hand When before the bar I stand Will he say my child well done Crown of life you now have won When my feet touch the streets of gold the streets of glory when I travel my last weary mile. Come on, boys. Will he hold my trouble and end? When before the war I stand, will he save my child? Will he crown of life and now be one? Will my feet touch the streets of Some happy morning you should miss me Well, don't you wait for me because I'm gone Cause I'll 
I'll be at the feet of the one who died for me When my feet touch the streets of gold Well, when my feet touch the streets of glory When I travel my last weary mile Will he hold my trembling hand When before the bar I stand Will he say, my child, well done Proud of life, you now have won When my feet touch the streets of gold that's the streets of glory When I travel my last weary mile Oh, we'll be trouble by trembling hand When the bar, the bar I stay We will say, my child, we'll bow the mind And I do not have one My feet touch the streets of gold Now when my feet touch the streets of gold Barriers to evangelism have always existed, but we have not allowed those barriers to stop the church from evangelizing the global community. Now, through immigration, the global community has come to us. The world is moving to North America. Do you have language skills, personal background, or experience with a specific culture of people? Do you feel a call to missions, but haven't been released by God to a global location? Multicultural Ministries wants to hear from you. Multicultural Ministries recruits full-time missionaries to target specific cultures with barriers that are here in North America. We're waiting for you. gift that God ever gave the Apostolic Church, the Body of Christ, is the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They walk among us today, and they are closer than you think. that anyone can teach a Bible study and that everyone should. When Your World is here to give you training, tools, and confidence that you need to teach a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. God has placed you exactly where you are to expand His kingdom and be a light to the lost. We believe in you and we know that with God's help, you can win your world. UPCI and United Insurance Solutions are pleased to introduce the first ever Voluntary Group Senior Medical Plan. We have partnered with the Hartford Insurance Company to present this plan. It works as a supplement to Medicare, where Medicare pays first, and the Group Medical Plan would cover all or some of the expenses not covered by Medicare. This plan would benefit anyone who is looking for a supplement to their Medicare plan. Highlights of this plan include Coverage is guaranteed. 
No medical questions required to enroll. Not subject to annual enrollment. You are able to enroll at any time. No networks. Freedom to choose providers and hospitals anywhere within the U.S. that accepts Medicare. Who is eligible? Any U.S. residing minister or minister's spouse who has enrolled in Medicare. Visit United Insurance Solutions at the Stewardship Group booth to see how you can enroll today. But whatever situation we face, go to God in prayer. God will be there. He will be by your side. His presence will be uh, with you. His presence will surround you. His voice speaks to you. He will help you in time of need. You will have the abiding presence of God. Hey. Are you looking for engaging and exciting apostolic books to add to your library? Well, look no further. Introducing the 2023 new releases from the Pentecostal Publishing House. to shop our new releases and library of apostolic resources. God, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving. We enter into your courts with praise. We thank you tonight for another opportunity to bless your name and to give you praise. That's why we're here, God, to give you praise to give you the glory that is due unto your name. So Lord, we lift you. God, we magnify you. We exalt you, Lord, in this place. Not just with our lips, but with our hands, God, we glorify you. With our voice, God, we lift you up in this place. God, we hold nothing back from you. Anybody here wanting to give God the glory that is due unto him? We know that there will never be enough Lord, everything that we have, we give. 
why God we trust you we can stand on your word we can stand on your promises we know that they are yea and amen anybody believe that tonight he's still alive not just here Who's but he is alive in your city and in your church and in your home but, oh, but you're alive and we trust you Lord we trust you Jesus We trust you, Jesus. Anybody trusting? Trusting his promises. Trusting his word. If you said it, God, that settles it. We believe it.
in this place tonight.
It is a great day to be a part of the church, and it's a great day to be a part of the United Pentecostal Church. I'm going to let you to return to your seats right now. Yesterday in our annual business session, the ministers of the United Pentecostal Church International who are present at this conference elected officers to serve our organization for the coming term. There are also some appointments that we're going to announce tonight. I'm delighted to present to you at this time the individuals who have been elected or selected to serve. First, and I will allow you to respond to this one, though we will hold applause for most, we very wisely re-elected our General Superintendent, David K. Bernard. For the remainder, I will ask you to hold your applause until we have concluded, and then we will honor them together. The Assistant General Superintendent for the Eastern Zone, Daryl Johns. The Assistant General Superintendent for the Western Zone, Stan Gleason. Newly elected because of Brother Howell's retirement, General Director of Global Missions, Adam Hunley. General Director of North American Missions, Scott Sistrunk. General Children's Ministries Pres Director Steve Cannon. Newly elected General Youth President DJ Hill. General, <laughs> there are young people here. General Ladies Ministries President Linda Gleason. General Executive Presbyter of the Western Zone Tim Gaddy. General Executive Presbyter of the Northwest Region Ted Graves. General Executive Presbyter for the North Central Region, David Trammell. General Executive Presbyter of the South Central Region, Gene Holly. Ministers Appeals Council members, Marvin Walker, Gary Tracy, and Brother Robert Henson, who because of a recent knee surgery cannot come up the steps, but he is here and we honor him tonight. Appointments President and Editor-in-Chief, for Pentecostal Resources Group, Robin Johnston. General Men's Ministries Director, Mike Williams. Global Missions Director of Education and Short-Term Missions, Jim Poitras. Regional Director for Central America and the Caribbeans, David Schwartz. Chairperson of the Office of Education and Endorsement Board, Dan Butler. Multicultural Ministries Director, Brock Chavis. Spanish Evangelism Ministries Director, John Burnett. Building the Bridge Ministries Director, Dave Henry. These are the individuals God has selected through the will of the brothers and sisters to lead this organization in important capacities. Would you pay them due tribute and honor tonight? Thank you for that, and now would you do what's even more important and extend your hands toward them, and let's pray together that God would cover and protect and bless these folks. Lift your voice and pray like a bunch of Holy Ghost-filled people pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you and pray your covering and blessing and protection over these individuals and their families. You have hand-selected and ordained these people to have influence in the United Pentecostal Church and thus in the body of Christ around the world. I pray, oh God, you would anoint them, empower them. Oh, oh Creator, would you put creative thoughts in their hearts and minds. Protect their bodies, their health, their possessions, their families. I pray a covering, Lord, over their lives, their minds, their health. And I ask God you would use them to carry out your will in the earth. Use them, O oh God, to impact this world with the gospel and prosper them in all that they do for the name of Jesus Christ. We pay them tribute, but all the glory and honor goes to you, Jesus. Do your work through these servants, I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. I thank God that the United Pentecostal Church is established in 238 nations and territories. And representing those nations and territories, we have with us tonight, and as I call your name, would you please stand, Randy Adams, Regional Director of Africa, 
Fakadu Desta from Ethiopia, Morgan Mwansa from Zambia, Afa Antoine from Ivory Coast, Lyndon Shalm, Regional Director of Asia, Les Clevenger from Japan, Stephen O'Donnell from Hong Kong and Macau, Renthle Laringsanga, UPC of Northeast India, Prince Matthias, Superintendent of Sri Lanka, Central America and the Caribbean region, Regional Director of that region is David Schwartz, Ogarth McCoy, Bishop of Jamaica, Dobert Clark, Superintendent of the Cayman Islands, Henry Ritchie, Superintendent of the Windward Islands, Europe and the Northeast Asia and North, North Africa region, Adam Hunley, who is the Regional Director and also the new General Director, Rick Robinson, President of the UPC of Turkey, Mark Sterren, President of the UPC of Lebanon, Sean Turner, Superintendent of the UPC of Israel and Palestine, Europe region, Nathan Herod, the Regional Director of Europe, Kevin Wallace, President of the UPC of Belgium, John Novaki, President of the UPC of France, Paul Brochu, the Sur Superintendent of Germany, Michael Patterson, President of the UPC of Romania, Stephen Tier, President of the UPC of Serbia, Robert Kelly, Superintendent of the Nordic Countries, Pacific Region, Roger Buckland, Regional Director of the Pacific, David Dibble, Superintendent of Micronesia, and Troy Rickett, uh, Tor Troy Wicket, Superintendent of Solomon Islands, South America, Michael Sponsler, the Regional Director. Would, would you please make welcome our representatives that have come to join us in our conference here in North America. God bless you, brethren. Thank you for being with us. We love you. We're praying for you, and God bless you. Annually at our general conference, the UPCI honors several individuals for their longstanding faithfulness and kingdom impact by inducting these heroes and heroines of the faith into what we call the order of the faith. The order of the faith denotes exemplary service and pays tribute to the outstanding achievement and impact on the United Pentecostal Church International made by these individuals. The following leaders were so honored on Monday evening of this week at the annual General Superintendent's Banquet. Please join me in honoring these individuals whose faces will appear on the screen who were inducted this week into the Order of the Faith. James and Martha Burton. Randy Keyes. C.P. Kilgore. J. Ellis Myers. And Trevor B. Neal. These are worthy of double honor. Thank you for that. We also want to recognize a group of ministers who are newly licensed in the UPCI. I wonder if the 2023 new ministers cohorts would please stand. These are individuals who have been credentialed within the last year. Please remain standing. Six, they represent the 667 new ministers in the UPCI during the last year. Last year's cohort encompassed the previous two years, and there are still 1,102 of those ministers active in that group. We welcome these to the ranks of the United Pentecostal Church, and I wish once again you'd pay tribute to these newly credentialed ministers among us. And finally, one of my highest honors at this general conference is to be privileged to pay honor to the military chaplains of the United Pentecostal Church International. Let me make it very clear. These individuals are dedicated first to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the apostolic message. They do not have to compromise that in any fashion to serve our country in the U.S. military as chaplains. They have met rigorous educational thresholds and earned endorsement by the UPCI. They minister to the men and women who serve our country in the military. These chaplains are fully recognized by the government of the United States and the branches of the governments they serve, the branches of the, of the military they serve. Chaplains, I wonder if you'd please stand so that we can see you well. Thank you for your service to our country and to the Lord Jesus Christ. We honor you tonight. 
for who you are and what you do. Thank you for standing. Since you're standing, having honored all these, would you please join me in obeying his word? Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many thankful for the goodness of the Lord? Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. We're here tonight to receive up an offering. And what a beautiful spirit of giving has swept over the United Pentecostal Church. Five million dollars, over five million dollars for global missions. Thank you, Jesus. And we're thankful for that. We're going to be like the Lord tonight. We're here to receive an offering. We're going to be like the Lord. We're going to do a quick work. Man, that's what I'm talking about. So, so tonight, one of the things I love about the United Pentecostal Church is... It is, a, it is a movement that is committed to the mission of Jesus, and that's what we're all about. That's what we're going to give to tonight, Ken. Absolutely. Chris and I are here tonight. I don't know if there's anybody in this building. Is there anybody here that is first-generation Pentecostal? Anybody? Your first generation. Come on, let me Come hear on. you. Let's hear the first-generation Pentecostals. That's what I'm talking about. We're so thankful tonight that we were shortly after our mother and father's divorce, our, step, our uh, mother got remarried, our stepfather was a terrible alcoholic. We were sitting on a bar stool in Sandoval, Illinois, began to make fun of Pentecost. And a man sitting down the row in, uh, on the bar said to him, I wouldn't make fun of that if I were you. He went out to his car and got a cassette, and the cassette was Brother Jonathan Urshan preaching, what will you do when they come after you, 666, you won't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. My stepdad, our stepdad, made up his mind he was going to go to a church. That's right. He stumbled into a church, an apostolic, united Pentecostal church. And before the preaching was over, ran to that altar, fell on his face. God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Come on. Are you thankful that it's a missional movement you're a part of? We it, wouldn't be here tonight. It wasn't too much longer. Our mother, who battled depression and all kinds of emotional issues got baptized in Jesus' name, came up out of the water speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Woo! And we're four years separated physically, but both of us, October 10th, 1984, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the exact same time. Come on, are you thankful for the power of the Holy Come on, Ghost? somebody. So tonight, as you give... We just want to keep the flow going that we're a missional movement. You heard all the first generation Pentecostals that are in the building tonight. The Bible said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Everything that happens in this life, you fill it from the outside in, but God fills us from the inside out because he wants the movement of God, the people of God, to be people that the resource is in them and is flowing out. We believe that tonight in this building. We're going to give tonight because we're thankful. Oh, I said we're going to give tonight because we're thankful. Thankful for the mission. Come on, somebody. If it had not been for Jesus, Woo, come on. there's no telling where we would be. But we're going to give tonight out of the abundance of our heart and thankfulness to the Lord. There's going to be a number on the screen. You can give to that. We're here tonight to worship the Lord and give, and God bless you.
I'm grateful to address you tonight because I had the honor of meeting these young people about 15 months ago at Indiana Camp Meeting. On Tuesday night, Pastor Aaron Brandt Bounds preached to us. Last night, Pastor Jerry Dean, and tonight we'll hear from our bishop. All three of these great leaders share one common formative influence. They are all preacher's kids. Preacher's kids are the unsung heroes of the apostolic church. They are in church every time the doors are open. They serve as greeters and ushers and musicians and singers and tech team members all across the UPCI. They are some of our most faithful volunteers and some of our greatest influencers in our Sunday schools and our youth groups. They love their local church, they love the UPCI, and they love God. These young people work selflessly in God's great harvest field alongside their faithful parents. Some of them live in the fishbowl of unrealistic expectations, and they have shared their mom and their dad with hundreds of church members. They've seen the church's blemishes as well as its beauty, but they are not bitter and they are not backslidden. They are wonderful young people, some of our most anointed prayer warriors and some of our most exuberant worshipers. They are not just the future of the great apostolic church, they are the present of this movement and the UPCI is sanctified proud of our preacher's kids. They are here tonight from across the great Indiana district. They sing under the direction of Pastor Darren and Miranda Williams. All of them are preacher's kids, all of them are anointed, and all of them are heroes to all of us. Would you join me in giving God great glory for the Indiana PK Choir?
introduce our keynote speaker, Brother Myron Wyman, Jr. Brother Wyman serves as associate pastor of the Cab United Pentecostal Church in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Serves under the leadership of his father, Bishop Wyman, Sr. Brother Wyman is a young man of outstanding character, and I assure you an excellent, excellent minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Brother Wyman comes, let's open up our hearts to the word of God and see what the Lord will do this evening. Praise God. Hallelujah. As you're making your way back to your seats, why don't you clap your hands one more time and give God a shout of praise. Come on, why don't you lift your voice and give God a big shout of praise. Come on, if God has been good to you, why don't you open your mouth, lift your voice, and tell Jesus thank you. Tell Jesus I love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. While you're standing, grab your Bibles very quickly. I want to direct your attention to the book of Luke, chapter 15. I'll read one verse for sake of time, and I'll let you be seated. Luke, chapter 15, we will read verse 20. The Bible says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Everybody said amen to the reading of the word. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. For a few moments tonight, I simply want to talk to you on this subject. We'll leave the light on for you. Tell somebody next to you, we'll leave the light on for you. Motel 6 is known for their low prices, among other things. But they're most known for their series of advertisements with Tom Bodet, who closed every ad with the line, we'll leave the light on for you. These ads ran from 1986 to 2016. Even people who don't travel often probably are familiar with this slogan. I can honestly say if I've ever stayed at a Motel 6 before or not, but there is something heartwarming about this slogan. We'll leave the light on for you. It creates an image of safety and comfort. It creates a nostalgic tie to when we were younger and our parents or loved ones left the front porch light on for us when we came home late at night. Perhaps it reminds you of a long, hard day of traveling, and when you finally reach home, the lights are on, welcoming you back. The church has to keep the lights on. Let me say it again. The church has to keep the lights on because there are prodigals, young and old alike, who are in the process of making their way back home. And as they are coming back home, they're wondering, Am I still welcome and wanted? Or have the church turned their lights off and erased me from their minds? Lord forbid anybody should ever wonder and go astray, but if it ever happens, it needs to be known that we'll leave the light on for you. You can always come back home. You can always have another chance. God still loves you. No matter what you are entangled and involved in, we will never stop waiting on you to come back home. Here in our text, Luke 15, we find one of the most classic parables in the Word of God. There was a young man who had been in his father's house his whole life, but he grew tired of the restriction that had governed him all these years. So. He told his father, give me my inheritance now so I can be free and live my life. He left and went as far away from his father's house as he could. You know the story. He eventually wasted his substance on riotous living in so much that when a famine arose, he found himself in need. But instead of going back home, immediately he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. His situation became so dire that he found himself in a pig's pen wanting to fill his belly with the husk they ate. Listen to me though, because while this prodigal son was in this predicament, the Bible says in verse 17 of Luke 15 that he came to himself. He said, why in the world am I out here when my father's servants eat better than this and I'm his son? 
I'm preaching this tonight because there are prodigals uh, who are in this situation right now. They are tired of living beneath their privileges uh, when they know that they are a child of God. Sin is taking a toll on them. The cigarettes are killing them. The alcohol is impairing them. The pornography is destroying their moral compass. The drugs are frying their brains and they are ready to come back home because there is something called the homing instinct the homing instinct is in every creature on this planet every creature has an inborn desire and an instinctive longing for their point of origin there is a homing instinct inside all of us that's why a dog can get lost but still travel miles and find his way back home the homing instinct is especially innate within every prodigal I want everybody to hear me tonight I don't care if your prodigal appears to be having the time of their life I promise you they miss being at home come on somebody they may not articulate it they may get agitated when you start talking about God and church but trust me your prodigal wants to come back home they miss the apostolic worship who am I preaching to they miss the apostolic preaching they miss the fellowship of the saints they are ready to come back home there's three levels to a prodigal home sick of home homesick home sick of home homesick our prodigals they are homesick right now and they are just one prayer one step away from coming back home I'm hurrying tonight I'm hurrying tonight this young man who left his father's house he made up his mind I have to get back home I love this young man because when he came to himself he did not say let me go take a shower first let me go get a haircut let me spray on some cologne he said but I'm coming home just as I am and I love the father y'all I love the father because when the father saw him the Bible says that he ran to him and had compassion on him and he kissed him thank God the father left the light on just in case his son decided to come back home I want y'all to notice tonight that when the father approached the son he did not greet him from afar but the father ran to his son and showered him with public affection he did not ask him where have you been what is your problem he said but we left the light on just in case you was coming back home I'm preaching to somebody tonight please don't turn the light off but leave the light on you keep praying for your product you keep fasting for your prodigal you keep believing in your prodigal because God is getting ready to send prodigals home the prodigal son my time is almost up the prodigal son repented he said father I've sinned against you in heaven but listen to what the father said he said we're not talking about that he told the servants go bring me a robe bring me a ring put some shoes on his feet kill the fatted calf we're getting ready to have a party I don't want to speak out of turn tonight but when prodigals make their way back home they don't want to be interrogated they don't want to be judged they don't want to be looked down. They know they messed up when they let they know they messed up when they left their father's house and wasted their apostolic inheritance. But they are saying, I'm back home now. Can you love me now with all of my issues, with all of my flaws, with all of my scars? Can you still love me? You have to understand that when prodigals come back home, they do not need a cold shoulder. They need a warm hug. They, they need somebody to pull them in and nurse them back to health. 
I'm closing. I have a minute left. I'm closing. I'm closing. Luke 15 is more than a parable to me. This is my life. I was a prodigal son. I was baptized at the age of seven by D.L. Knight at DeKalb United Pentecostal Church in Stone Mountain, Georgia. My, my mother and my father, Pastor and Sister Whiteman, they raised me up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. But at 15 years old, I backslid. I started smoking marijuana, drinking alcohol, getting in trouble with the law. But 19 years ago, I came to myself and I made my way back home because the lights were still on. And that was 19 years ago. Look what the Lord has done. I said, look what the Lord has done. I don't care how your prodigal looks. I don't care how they sound. Don't you ever turn the light off. Well, praise God, that was a word, wasn't it? I know I have some prodigals that need to come home, and I'm believing for it. Amen. Well, good evening. It's an honor to be up here, even though this is a place I told myself I would never want to be. But when the opportunity came to introduce someone who is very important to me and very special in my life, I knew I would regret it if I didn't accept. So, of course, you're all familiar with the many accolades of our general superintendent. But if you'll allow me for just a brief moment, I'd like to tell you about my father-in-law and my first pastor. So my parents were first-generation Pentecostal. And through a Bible study given by a neighbor in Michigan, our family ended up through a series of events in a little startup church in Austin pastored by some man who started writing a lot of books. Well, it was under his ministry that I received the Holy Ghost, that I was baptized in Jesus' name, and where I learned to love and live for Jesus. And I am and always will be eternally grateful for how I was shaped and how I was formed under his very capable leadership. Well, the years went by, and I noticed he did a pretty good job raising his oldest son, Jonathan, so I married him. (laughs) Turned out pretty good. And there's been so many blessings in being connected with his family that I don't take for granted. But with that being said, I've always appreciated that he didn't expect me to be somebody that I'm not just because I married into the family. Rather, he wanted me to seek God's will for my life. And he encouraged me. He's given his wholehearted support wherever and whenever it was needed. So I love in particular that I can talk to him about any subject, ministry, life, desperately needed advice, or, you know, just whatever random question pops in my head that day, whenever they're in town and we have dinner together often, That's what we do, is we gather around the table and just talk. But I confess that I don't get to do that as much as I'd like because we have to share him with all of y'all. And I hear that we're gonna have to share for another two years, so I guess I'll have to pray and be okay with that. But really, words could never be enough to express how much I love and I appreciate my father-in-law. I deeply respect and I admire this man and his influence on my life. So I'm gonna get out of the way now because I can't wait to hear my pastor preach again. So please welcome our general superintendent, David K. Bernard. Thank you so much, Sarah. I asked my family to pray, remain standing, because I could not do my job 
I cannot be the person I am without my wife and all of my kids and grandkids. So would you pray with them and with me that God will help me do a good job preaching the word tonight. Let's pray together. Let's praise the Lord together right now for his blessing. You may be seated. I think we're getting everybody settled, including the bass player. Might take a minute, but I told the ladies at the minister's wives' breakfast the other morning that, well, it looks like you're stuck with us for another two years. And I feel honored and privileged to serve the Lord in this, in this position. There's nothing that I could do for him to repay everything that he has done for me. And my song of life should be always that I give him glory for everything that he's done. And I'm thankful for him. I say thanks for the things you have done for me, things so undeserved, yet you came to prove your love. a million angels could not express my gratitude all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to me
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. While you're standing, I'd like to read a verse of scripture. It is an honor to be asked to preach here and to be the general superintendent of this great body. It's not something I ever planned or dreamed or envisioned, but I do count it a great honor. And I'm so thankful to my wife. She really is probably at least 51% of my ministry or maybe even more than that. If you, if you ask the church where I pastored, if, if my wife had ever got, ever got into a major disagreement, I, I knew they would choose her over me every time. So, so we, I tried never to have a disagreement. But Psalm 69.9, I'd like to read from the first half of that. Psalm 69.9 says this. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. A little bit of an unusual expression, isn't it? The zeal of your house has eaten me up. I want to preach tonight consumed by zeal. Consumed by zeal. You may be seated. I do want to say just a little bit more about my family my oldest son, Jonathan, and Sarah, you heard her tonight. I do remember we started the church and her family came. I think she was five years old. They were from the Catholic Charismatic Movement. I remember the first time they came and they enjoyed it. We were just a small church and a little rented building. And she said, you know, we, well, we, and we were having afternoon service because that's the only time we could have the building. And they started coming faithfully to our little church. They decided when they moved to Austin, they would look for a spirit-filled church instead of a Catholic church. And they found us, of all things. And I remember when they had to miss the next Sunday, she said, well, we're going to have to miss Mass next Sunday, but we'll be back. I said, okay. And all these years later, they're faithful. And so Jonathan and Sarah are serving in, in essence, it's kind of like a granddaughter work, but they have a church in a rented building where they're the associate pastor they're in the transition process to be the senior pastor. They've got land and getting ready to build. And so it's exciting to see my kids involved in missions. They've got three kids that are all in church, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then my second son and his wife, Daniel and Kaylee, they work for North American Missions as the production coordinator. And actually he was asked to, to coordinate the last couple of general conferences uh, it wasn't really my plan, but I think he's doing a good job, at least so far. So uh, we appreciate Daniel. And then my daughter, Lindsay, and her husband, Cullen, he's, uh, and Daniel and Kaylee have two little girls. The older has received the Holy Ghost. And then uh, Lindsay and Cullen, Cullen is a professor at Urson College, and they've just launched, well, a few Urson kids. They've just launched... Uh, Home Missions Church or North American Mission Church in Wentzville, Missouri. And uh, so they're also, uh, they've got one uh, child and uh, I've, we have one grandson on the way. So we're excited about that from Daniel and Kaylee. But I, admit, I take the time to mention that because the main thing for me is all of my family is serving the Lord. And that's the most important. Um, and I know sometimes you heard a wonderful message about prodigals. You could be the best parent in the world and still have a prodigal. I understand that. But I'm just thankful. It makes my job so much easier because I have that kind of faithful support. And uh, it's a bonus that four of them are, ha are credential ministers. And Sarah, I think, is getting ready to meet her district board. And I think maybe one more might be trying for it in the future. I'm not sure, but what an amazing thing that my kids are also not only involved in ministry, but credentialed ministers. So it's just such a blessing. And uh, it's a heritage. 
that I receive, uh, and, and I'm so thankful they're involved in missions, North American missions, all of them, uh, because that's our heartbeat. And of course, I'm the conduit. My mom and dad were credentialed missionary, ministers of the UPCI for over 50 years, pioneer missionaries to Korea. My mom was first generation. My dad, his family came in the church when he was a child. So we have a wonderful heritage. I'm taking that time because I'm trying to convey uh, something important tonight. Consumed by zeal. Now the passage I read, of course, first and foremost applies to Jesus Christ. In fact, the apostles noted that in John chapter 2. But I think it also applies to us because we're supposed to be like Christ. And what I'm trying to convey tonight, and you hear the theme of this conference, we're a blessed people. We're blessed as American and Canadian citizens, probably greater than any people in the history of planet Earth. But yet we also are blessed spiritually to have a great heritage. Even if you're first generation like the Dillinghams, what a heritage they have of a testimony of deliverance, how God brought their family in the church. Of all things, we don't go to a bar to hear from God, but God can talk to somebody in a bar. What a heritage. And behind me is our executive committee and also our ministry leaders. I appreciate their faithful support because they're 100% working with me, praying with me, and uh, all of you, I feel so much support and prayer. But I want us to go beyond the comfortable. You heard it the last two nights, and you heard it with Brother Dean last night, but somehow there must be an urgency. There must be a burden. That word zeal means fervor, eager desire, enthusiastic diligence, passion, Somehow we've got to have that kind of zeal, a passion for the kingdom of God that will motivate us to move forward into the will of God. It's true, we are a missional church. We're a missional organization. We exist for the whole gospel to be preached to the whole world by the whole church. It can't be something added to our agenda. It has to be our heartbeat. We have to be consumed with zeal to do the work of the Father, consumed by zeal. And so I go to John chapter 12, verse 24 through 25. What does it mean to be consumed? And Jesus explained, and again, it applies to himself and to his sacrificial death, but by extension, it applies to us as followers of the Lord. John 12, 24 Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So verse 24 is talking about Jesus first and foremost, that if he did not die, he could not save the world. But then he applied it to us. We obviously cannot make atonement for the sins of anybody, but we must have that same sacrificial attitude of giving our life away. It's paradoxical, but if we hoard our life and consume it with pleasure in the end, after 70, 80, or however many years, it's gone, it's over, there's nothing left. But if we spend our life for the kingdom of God, if we're consumed by zeal for souls, if we give ourselves away, if we lose our life in the end, we will step into eternal life. That's the only life worth living, a life of zeal and fervor and passion for the kingdom of God. Somehow, we've got to go beyond the ordinary, the superficial, the average, the routine, the mediocre, the everyday, and we've gotta be passionate about the kingdom of God. We've gotta be fervent in worship. We've gotta have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. We have to have a love for souls, a love for prodigals it must consume us it must eat us up it must dominate our thoughts and our plans our dreams and our visions we need to be consumed by zeal the words that come to mind are consecration commitment 
sacrifice. Notice those words in John are the key to the harvest. The key to the harvest. He says, verily, truly, it's the truth, except there's no way around it, unless this is the only way. You've got to fall into the ground. You've got to humble yourself. You can't glorify yourself and win souls. You can't glorify yourself and build a church. If you do, it'll be a superficial church, but it will not stand the test of time. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you got to fall down. If you want to win a soul and disciple a convert, you got to fall down. If you want to be a, a church planner, you got to fall down. You got to humble yourself, get rid of yourself, forget about yourself. Don't seek an office or a position or a title, but you seek the kingdom of God. You see, when you're consumed by zeal, a title really doesn't matter, Brother Howe. Thank God for the privilege of serving, but I'm not here for a title. I'm here to make a difference, and if I can't make a difference, forget it. I've got to be consumed by zeal for the house of God. I'm talking about commitment. I'm talking about consecration. I'm talking about sacrifice. Fall in the ground and die. Unless you do that, it's the only way. You'll abide alone. But when you die, you'll bring forth much fruit. He's talking about wheat in that analogy or parable. One spike of wheat could have 100 grains. Do a little math. The first harvest, you got 100 grains. Really not enough for a meal, but if you could take 100 seeds and replant them, now you've got 10,000. You take 10,000, plant them again. By the fourth harvest, you have billions of seeds. So we could have a million soul revival and a billion soul revival with just a few harvests, with just a few people falling in the ground and dying, and then doing it again and do it again. By the fourth harvest, we're gonna have a revival that will literally shake this entire world, but we gotta be consumed by zeal. So we go to the first century, the early apostles. We like to say we're apostolic. Well, 11 of those apostles, according to early history, died a martyr's death. And the 12th was exiled in the Isle of Patmos. How apostolic do you wanna be? The apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beaten shipwrecked, stoned, hungry, naked, attacked by beasts. And if that wasn't enough, the care of all the churches. Attacks inside as well as outside. That's our apostolic heritage. We don't like to major on that, but apostolic heritage is sacrifice. Apostolic heritage is commitment. Not only first century, but the modern Pentecostal movement. We don't really know our history. Let me just hit, highlight just shortly a few stories. Eleanor Gamblin, Canadian. She wrote a book called The Sparrow Song years ago. I don't think it's even in print. But she and her husband, Garland Leonard, went to China. This was in the 20s and 30s. And they were engulfed by civil war and then the invasion of the Japanese. And he was killed. And so she became an apostolic missionary widow, returned back home to Canada. She married a second time another preacher whose name was Sanford Johnston. And they felt a call to go to Columbia, one of the first missionaries to Columbia, South America. He was a great intercessor. They didn't have much success as far as winning souls, but subsequent missionaries credit the great revival much to the intercession of this man, Sanford Johnston. But he died in Columbia on the mission field. And so Eleanor Gamblin came back a missionary widow the second time. Not a great success story. Not something you'd want to immolate. But the great revivals that we have in China and in Colombia, I believe God honored the sacrifice, the commitment, the prayer of an Eleanor Gamblin, twice a missionary widow. That's our heritage, 20th century Pentecost. Werner Larson, one of the pioneers to Columbia, also from Canada. He went over there with his young wife and two children and preached and 
didn't have much results, but one of the pioneers, his wife died in childbirth while he was on the mission field. They were evangelicals in a Catholic country. Nobody would bury them. Nobody would do the funeral service. He had to build the coffin for his own wife. He had to personally put his own wife. He had to dig the grave and put his own missionary wife into the ground and left with two young children. That's a United Pentecostal Church missionary pioneer. And Columbia later had a million soul revival because of sacrifice like the intercessor Sanford Johnston and like the sacrificial pioneer Werner Larson. We don't know those stories. We just know the victory stories. Well, there was also Bill and Molly Thompson. They were from the UK, missionaries, actually Trinitarians, converted to oneness. She wrote a book, I'm not sure it's in print, of Caesar's household. And she talked about the great persecution that came to Columbia in the 1950s, where our own United Pentecostal people were persecuted, chased from their homes, chased from their villages, chased out of the valley, and she attributes the great revival that swept that nation and went into other countries because just like the first century church, the believers were chased out of their home area to all parts of Colombia and South America. And many of our other works in South America have roots from that great Colombian revival. But it wasn't all rosy. Some of the, these, these bandits would come and they specifically attack the evangelicals. The United Pentecostal Church of Columbia became the largest church outside the Roman Catholic Church. They became a target of these people who hated the Protestants or the evangelicals or the Pentecostals. They would hunt them up. They would beat them up. They would chase them from their homes. Sometimes they would kill them. Our saints, Emilio and Rosa Okendo, were sitting in their home, attacked by these anti-Pentecostal bandits. They forced Sister Okendo to make them food, and then they did what they call the T-shirt cut. El corte de franela. Chopped off their head so they looked like a T-shirt. And that United Pentecostal couple were martyred for their faith. A young man named Nelson Galvis was coming home from church, 18 years old. The bandits were lying in wait for the pastor. They saw this young man coming up in the dark. They thought he was the pastor. So they attacked and killed him. Just a teenager, martyred for the faith, United Pentecostal Church. Even here in the United States, Homer White, his stories and profiles of Pentecostal preachers, volume two. He was a United Pentecostal Church minister. He was the second person baptized in Jesus' name east of the Mississippi River. So one day, Homer White was going to church. A Trinitarian mob attacked him, started beating him up, broke his nose. They said, we'll show this oneness person what he needs to do. They took him to a horse trough and they immersed him three times so he would have a Trinitarian baptism. Then they took him to the bridge. They were going to throw him in the river, give him another baptism. Probably would have killed him, but they were stopped. Somebody rescued him. So here's Homer White, rescued from the mob, beaten, bleeding, bruised, wet, muddy. What do you think he did? Well, I told you he was on his way to church. So he dusted himself off and he went to church. That's our Pentecostal heritage. Second man baptized in Jesus' name east of the Mississippi. How many of us here right here tonight are baptized in Jesus' name east of the Mississippi? It's because of people like Homer White who are consumed by zeal. All they could think of is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, holiness, worship, go to church, preach, teach, pray, love. Some of you have heard me tell the story of my parents, but I think it's worth telling. There's stories in the Korean frontier. But the reason why I am here, the reason why I am what I am, is because of my parents' commitment. So they were called to Korea 
and they were appointed in 1963. I'll just tell a few highlights. I was a little kid of seven years old when in this story, I was eight when we went to Korea. And I do remember it from being part of it. I also remember my parents telling me the story many times and I helped edit my dad's book. So I know the details of the story. But I remember we'd bought a brand new car to go on our deputational travel. And as we're heading to New Orleans to get our passports to ultimately go to Korea, we were hit head on, had a terrible automobile accident. And there, we even have the report from the newspaper of that accident. But I remember personally, so my dad would have been 33 years old, my mom 32. And I remember looking up, my dad's nose was bleeding, both of his arms were broken, his nerve in his right hand was severed. The doctor said he wouldn't ever be able to use it, but God later healed him. He was able to shake the doctor's hand and show him the miracle. Praise God. My mother's neck was broken. The doctor said she came within a hair's breadth of death. She had a brain concussion. She did not remember six weeks of her life. I remember waking up in that car after the accident, looking up, seeing my dad bleeding, sitting there, patiently waiting as people gather around. They're trying to pry us loose from the car. I felt something in my head. I put my hand on my head and I had a cut from the front to the back, uh, which you can't see today because I use it to part my hair. But I remember, I remember bringing my hands down, it was full of blood. I started panicking. I started gasping. And my dad said, it's okay, everything's okay, don't worry. You're gonna be fine. And I remember the ambulance getting my mom and me out. We rode in the ambulance to the hospital. My mom calming me down, she didn't remember anything. It took my dad another 30 minutes before they could pry him out of the car. So we got to the hospital. I had to stay with relatives for six weeks. And uh, my dad was in the hospital while there. He began witnessing to a nurse. She repented of her sins and began crying in the hospital room. He sent her to a UPCI church where she was baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost, even in the midst of trial. So a few years ago, this lady passed away. Her son contacted me and he said, I wanna get a message to your dad. My mom has passed away, but she stayed in the church the rest of her life. She brought her whole family in the church. He said, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. We're all in church today because of your dad's testimony in the hospital. God doesn't exempt us from trials, but God can work in the middle of our trials. So neighboring pastor came to my dad, visited him in the hospital. People actually would... One lady came to the hospital, one of our relatives, and when she saw my dad, she fainted. It was so bad. Well, this guy came, my dad's neighboring pastor friend, and he said, Brother Bernard, God's trying to get your attention. God's trying to tell you, you missed his will. He's trying to stop you from going to Korea. Now, what would you say? My dad's 33 years old, lying flat on his back in the hospital, can't feed himself, can't dress himself, both arms immobilized, his wife, my mom, is in the next room, incapacitated, unconscious. They don't know if she's going to live or die. What would you say? Well, my dad said, God only has to tell me one time what to do. We're going to Korea. <laughs> Commitment. Consumed by zeal. I didn't realize the full impact until my parents' passing, my dad's funeral Brother Jerry Jones, who was then general secretary, I was general superintendent, and Brother Jones shared this testimony with our family. He said, I was a young man in college feeling call of God, but feeling I couldn't do it. So he said, I was struggling to feel that I was not able or worthy. He said, I went to a missionary service. He said, your dad gave that testimony. And Brother Jones said, when my dad gave that testimony, God has to tell me only one time what to do, and I'm going to do it. Brother John said, God spoke to him and said, how many times do I have to tell you? And that's the night Brother Jones accepted. He had already felt the call, but that's the night he's accepted the call. I asked him if it was okay for me to tell the story, consumed by zeal. And so what impressed me at my dad's funeral, here am I the general superintendent of the UPCI. Here's the general secretary's testimony of the UPCI. 
There's no way that 30, actually 33 year old man lying flat on his back, there's no way he could understand the consequences of his decision over 50 years later. But that commitment, that sacrifice, that zeal, that irrational decision, so to speak, dramatically affected the history of the United Pentecostal Church International. I wouldn't be here without that commitment. Maybe Brother Jones wouldn't have got accomplished what he had accomplished without that commitment. Not to speak of the United Pentecostal Church of Korea, hundreds of preachers, hundreds of soldiers, Americans and Caucasians, African Americans, Hispanics, Koreans, hundreds and thousands by that one decision. You can't look and plan your career. You have to be consumed by zeal. You have to be committed. You have to be consecrated. You have to sacrifice. You count the cost, but then lay it aside and say, regardless of the cost, I must do the will of God. Regardless of the sacrifice, I'm consumed by zeal. It's eating me up. I cannot do anything else. Consumed by zeal. And that was just the beginning. So we got on a ship to go to Korea with all of our belongings. Out in the Caribbean, the ship caught on fire. We raced to the Panama Canal Zone. We've got the story of the ship catching on fire. And it was a freighter, it's a long story, where had kerosene, gallons of kerosene barrels on the deck. We finally got to the Panama Canal Zone, which at that time was U.S. territory. American firefighters took the ship out to sea, put the fire out, and they told my dad, 5% more heat, the whole ship would have exploded. And there was a Chinese dentist who was the other passenger, and we'd shared our testimony. In fact, I was eight years old, there was a brand new book called They Speak With Other Tongues. I was reading, it was about the charismatic movement. And he saw me reading that book, he's wondering, wanted to know what it was all about, so I told him about the Holy Ghost. I told him about Acts 2.38, speaking in tongues. And so, so he, when he heard the firefighters say that, he told my dad, we're alive because of you missionaries. Your God protected the whole ship because of you missionaries. We're, we're saved because of you, because your God protected you. Now in those days, we, were, we went to Korea for five years before returning home. And that was before Partners in Mission, so my parents had to sign a statement saying they understood that the budget was not guaranteed. It was just proposed, and depending on how much money came in to headquarters, it would be divided among all the missionaries that month. And if there was enough in their budget, they would get it. But if there wasn't enough, they wouldn't get it. So they had to sign a statement saying they understood no money was guaranteed to come. In that first five years, we only had three visits from American preachers. When we left, my, wife, my mom's mother had cancer, inoperable. She knew she would never live to see my family again. She told my mom, I'm saved, I'm okay. People in Korea are lost. You gotta go win the lost. And so my mom, at age 32, said goodbye to her mother, never to see her again. That was before internet, before email, actually even before satellite. There was a cable where you could, to call America, you had to pay an exorbitant sum of money, go downtown to the post office, get, uh, get in line, and wait half a day to the cable to open up and get a, just a scratchy time-lapse connection. And so we had to communicate by letter. So the way we found out my grandmother had died is my mom opened the letter and the obituary, obituary fell out. The funeral was already gone. And that's how we knew that grandmother had passed away. It just so happened my dad's mom also passed away during that first time. So they never saw their mothers again. It's a lot different than it is today. It was isolated. And so I remember my dad going into the basement where he had an office and he would pound on that manual typewriter, hundreds of letters by hand, pleading for money. Finally got enough money to build a piece of, to buy a piece of property in the city of Seoul. So they erected a tent. I think I have a picture of that tent. That was the first United Pentecostal Church of Korea. 
And uh, then after that, uh, maybe it'll show, there it is. And then after that, he raised enough money to build a basement. So then we had church in the basement. And then after that, he built, raised enough money for the first floor, and then the second floor, and then the Bible school, and then the dorms. But it was at great cost and sacrifice. That's just a little bit. And after there was great revival, back then, now this is the 70s, I saw in one week's time hundreds of people receiving the Holy Ghost. That was unheard of. I saw what was possibly the greatest Jesus name baptism since the day of Pentecost and maybe one of the greatest today. In one hour, I watched 12 preachers baptize 550 people in the name of Jesus Christ. One hour. But it was sacrifice. After that, it was great persecution. I, I came back to go to college where I remember visiting them while I was still a college student. In the meantime, they'd suffered a lot of persecution, physical persecution. Trinitarians were trying to stop the oneness message. And I remember sitting in the car, the Land Rover, the She's for Christ, move the mission vehicle. And my mom was telling me a story. She said, yeah, we were in this little church. Dad was at the pulpit leading service and a, group, a gang of Trinitarians ran in there to stop the service. They attacked your dad. He, w he refused to stop preaching. He just kept right on going while they were attacking him. He just held on to the pulpit. So they had to knock the pulpit over, grab him by the necktie and physically drag him out uh, of the building. And she said, of course, she was small and petite, but very proper and always a Southern woman with impeccable manners and dress. She said, they picked me up bodily and just, they just threw me in the street. She said, I was so embarrassed in front of hundreds of people walking up and down the street, this dirt street. She says, I just thrown out, lying out on the ground, middle of the street. She says, I picked myself up. I tried to dust myself off. And she says, I straightened my dress. And then she said, I got so excited because I remember in Acts 5, 46, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. She says, I started worshiping. She said, I was bruised, I was hurt, but I felt like running up and down the street saying, I'm worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. I'm worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. I'm apostolic, I'm apostolic. When she finished telling me that story, she said, I was up at walking down that dirt street. And she said, when I walk up the streets of gold, when I walk up the streets of gold, how my heart will rejoice in that morning when I walk up the streets of gold. That's my heritage. That's my heritage. My parents were not famous, but they rejoiced that they could suffer shame because they saw the revival. And so I went to college. I felt like I wanted to be a lawyer. I did go to law school. I did pass the bar, became a lawyer. I was always going to work for God, and I did work for God. Taught Bible studies, won souls. I was involved in youth ministry, children's ministry, nursing home ministry, uh, you know, campus ministry, you name it. I was involved in everything. But people would say, you're going to be a preacher just like your dad. You're going to be a missionary just like your mom and dad. I would say, no way. I wasn't running for the call, but I knew, look, that's sacrifice. That's commitment. God would have to call me. There's no way I could do that unless God absolutely called me because I knew too much. I knew that there was, I would have to be consumed by zeal. This can't be a family business. This can't be passed down like a monarchy. This can't be, well, this is the best career that will make more money than the alternatives. No, I had to have a burden. I had to have a zeal. It had to be, I can't do anything else. It would have to be a fire shut up in my bones. If, if, if you feel like preaching, if you could choose any other career and be happy, you should choose the other career career and be happy and let God bless you in the local church. 
But if you can't do anything else, then you know when you're consumed by zeal, then you know when there's no, when there's a fire shut up in your bones, you can't do anything else consumed by zeal. I'm not a preacher by choice. I'm a preacher because God said, this is what you're called to do. Obviously, we have a choice, but you must be consumed by zeal. So my last year of law school, I did feel a call to preach. And I won't go into all that story. I do tell it in my book, Reaching Austin. But I was kind of naive. Uh, Brother Gleason, if a young man came to me and asked advice, I probably would not tell him to do what I did. Because what I did, I had all these job interviews lined up with law firms from Washington, D.C. to Houston to Austin to Los Angeles. I had all these job interviews or potential interviews, and I just shut them all down because God called me to preach. So when I graduate from law school, I'm going to be a preacher. So I get to March of my graduation, and uh, so I get ministerial license with the Texas District, and uh, I've been dating we got secretly engaged, then we got March, I got public engaged, but I didn't have a job when we got married. So I'm graduating in May, getting married in June, and I don't have a job. And my dad said, you want me to start calling all my pastor friends and seeing if they'll let you preach somewhere? I said, no, dad, I got, this is something I got to do on my own. God's going to open the door. So right around April the 30th, I got called to go to Jackson for an interview. And I was hired on or around April the 30th to be a full-time instructor and administrator, Jackson College of Ministries in Jackson, Mississippi. Graduated in May, got married June 6th. Two weeks later, we're in Jackson, we're in full-time ministry. It was a close run thing. That's why I say, I'm, I wouldn't sure, I'm not sure I'd recommend somebody do that. But see, that's all I could think about. I'm gonna be a preacher. I'm gonna be full-time in ministry. By the time I get married, I'm gonna have a full-time ministry position. It didn't make sense, but somehow it worked out. And then in 1992, we went to Austin, felt a call, started in our home, rented building for four years, first building, second building. I'm so thankful for Pastor Rodney Shaw that when, we, when I was elected general superintendent, there was a church of about 1,000 people we had a number of daughter works today. There, there are 23 daughter works or daughter works or, or churches that were started by a preacher or taken over by a preacher. 23 in the New Life Network. And it's a beautiful building on the freeway. Initial seating capacity, 1,000 room to add, 2,500, 500 parking spaces, $36 million value from starting in our home. It's just amazing. I could have never planned it. I could have never known it. And understand, I'm telling you my story because I think any church planner can relate. You don't have to try to duplicate whatever we did. But I really don't attribute it to me. I attribute it to my parents. Because all the time I was thinking, man, my parents opened a whole country. My parents brought revival to a whole country. My parents, by, by the time they left Korea, they, they planted 23 churches and three military fellowships. There's no way I could ever do that. So I'm thinking, no matter what I do, it will never be that good. I just have to work hard and do whatever God's called me to do. And then they had a second career of opening Spanish ministry in Louisiana. And that's another story. But I attribute it to my parents' commitment, my parents' sacrifice. They fell into the ground and died. And I'm here today. And I can tell nice stories about what God did in Austin, not really because I sacrificed, but because people going before me were consumed by zeal. And maybe I was able to capture some of that zeal. Maybe I was able to capture some of that fervor. That's what it's going to take today. Even today around the world, we've got persecution in Myanmar, Chin State. Hundreds, maybe thousands of our believers have been driven out of their homes some of our churches burned down. Same thing in Northeast India, Manipur. Same thing in Papua New Guinea, the Highlands. Same thing in Pakistan with Muslim attacks on United Pentecostal believers. Same thing in Haiti with our Bible school and orphanage overrun by gangs. So you know that persecution seems so foreign to us, 
But United Pentecostal believers around the world today are paying the price for serving Jesus Christ. I don't think I want to stand next to them in the judgment. I think I want to be, I don't even think I want to stand next to my parents in the judgment. I think I want to be like 10 spaces behind them. Put me behind a bunch of Americans uh, of the 21st century church. Don't put me next to Haiti and Myanmar and, and Pakistan. But what about us? What about us? What about North America? What are we supposed to do? We aren't facing that kind of physical persecution. I'm not suggesting we should desire it, but I do believe there's social persecution. I believe there's ostracism, there's ridicule, there's attack on families, there's attack on children, there's attack on schools, but it's a different kind of persecution. But the same kind of commitment and consecration and sacrifice that I told you about from the first century and the 20th century and the missionaries and the overseas constituents, somehow we Americans and Canadians must get some fortitude, some determination, some commitment, some zeal. We've got to be consumed by zeal. Our circumstances may be different. Our battles may be different. Our sacrifice may be different. But it should be no less than all the rest. We've got to sacrifice. We've got to commit. We've got to be consumed. We've got to stand. How do we do that? You know, our culture is... I think exactly like Isaiah 5, 20 through 21. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. That's our culture. That's our school system. That's our government. That's our media. That's, that's the culture we live in, the inversion of good and evil. And we're being called the ridiculous people because we want to say good is good and evil is evil. So what do we do? Let me share a few things. Number one, seek the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Seek it. First Kings 22, King Jehoshaphat, the good king, was allied with King Ahab, the evil king. They were going to fight the Syrians. And so they were getting ready to march to battle and the, and the godly king said, wait a minute. Before we do that, in 1 Kings 22, 5, first, let's find out what the Lord says. And so Ahab says, okay, sure, fine. I got 400 prophets. And they all prophesied, go, God's gonna give you victory. Joshua says, well, isn't there a prophet of the Lord? I mean, I just don't want a word. I want a word from God. I don't want a sermon, I want the truth. I want a doctrine. I don't just want a doctrine. I want the word of God. I don't want a denomination or an organization or a cultural message. I want to hear from God. There might be 400 false prophets, but I got to find one true prophet. Well, they did find Micaiah. He sized up the situation. It's obvious he must have been sarcastic because he says, because they warned him ahead of time. Now, 400 prophets already prophesied. You better fall in line. So he says, okay. He says, go. Everything will be just fine. And even Ahab said, you're supposed to tell me the truth. He said, if you want to know the truth, I saw you did. That's what I saw. If you don't, if you go, you're going to be killed. And Ahab said, lock that guy up till I come back. And the prophet said, if you come back, I'm not a prophet. You're not coming back. And the word came to pass. I'm saying, don't go by the majority. Don't go by the culture. Don't go by denominationalism. We got to seek the truth. We got to hear from God. We need a prophet of God. We need a man or woman of God in this culture, in this hour. We cannot just follow the trends of the world, no matter how enticing they meet. We need to hear from God. We need to hear from God. We need the word of God. We need the truth. Number one, seek the truth. Number two, stand for truth. It's not enough to know it, you gotta stand for it. Not when it's easy, when it's hard. I don't mean being hateful, obnoxious, caustic, but you gotta stand for truth. 
Daniel and the three young Hebrews. Now notice, they had great influence in their society. They were engaged in politics. They rose high in secular society. I'm not against all that. But in the back of your mind, you gotta remember, I'm a child of God. I'm an apostolic. I can go places, I can have influence, I can speak to politicians, I can have places in business, I can have a profession, I can do all kinds of things. But let me tell you, in, I believe this, in every person's life and in every preacher's life, there will become a decisive moment. Do you wonder why there are prominent preachers and their sons rise to prominence? And please let me say this, because I'm a preacher's kid, okay? And I've got preacher's kids. And they rise to prominence because of their parents. And maybe they step into a great church and then five or 10 year, years, years later, they've totally changed the doctrine. And you think, how could that be? How could you be raised without heritage? And where's the ethics of taking your father's church and destroying his legacy? Go start your own church with your own doctrine. <laughs> Leave your heritage. If you don't like your heritage, Leave it back. If you're gonna be the prodigal, leave the father's house, but don't mess with the father's farm. Don't burn down the father's house. Don't steal his crop. Just go do your own thing and prove how big you are. But let me tell you why that happens. I don't care how apostolic you are and how great your heritage is. There comes a time when you will have to make a personal decision. And you have to have your mind made up before the time comes. So the three young Hebrews were in this high position. And then the king made an unfair decree. When the music starts, you got to bow to the idol. So they're all standing. The music starts. The whole congregation bowed. But these three young men. The king gave them a second chance. And they said... You know, whether God delivers us or not, doesn't matter. We already made up our mind. If, if we get thrown in the fire furnace and burn up, we already decided. Now, we believe our God will deliver us. Don't worry about that. But if he doesn't, we already made up our mind. We're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. We're not going to compromise. We're going to stand for truth if it kills us. We're going to stand for truth if we're the only ones standing. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. I'm going to stand for truth. You can engage. You can influence. But don't compromise. Sooner or later, you will face a, a sec a se seductive and deceptive influence. And you'll have to make a decision. At the key moment... Don't bow. Maintain your integrity and your commitment. Number three, that's not even enough. You gotta love the truth. You gotta love it. If you don't love the truth, one of those times you'll be deceived and you'll actually think it's the truth and it's not. The scary thing is revelation and deception can feel the same. Now we believe in the move of God, we believe in emotions. But if you're just preaching on your feelings, if you're preaching because it sounds good and the audience responds, you better be careful because revelation and deception can actually feel the same. How do you know the difference? You gotta love the truth. You think that's too strict? Second Thessalonians two. 9 through 12, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. Lying power, signs, lying wonders with all unrighteous deception. Deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I was raised in Korea. The majority are non-Christians. They're Buddhists. They're spirit worshipers. They're nature worshipers. They're ancestor worshipers. But there's a lot of good people, good moral people. And so you struggle. Can all these people be lost? 
And they're good denominational pre- uh, Christians that don't really follow the truth as we know it. Are they all going to be lost? And so intellectually and theologically, I have reason like this. Well, everybody has a witness in creation. Everybody has a witness in conscience. And those who have the Bible have the witness of the Bible. And so God can say, if you would have sought it, I would have shown you more. And if you'd love what you saw, I would give you more. And eventually I'd give you enough to be saved. Look at Cornelius. He didn't know the truth. He didn't know Jesus, but he sought what he knew. And because he sought it, God kept leading him until he found enough truth to be saved. So I can say that pagan is going to stand before God and he won't get off because he didn't love the truth. That denominational person who didn't really pursue the Bible, God can say, you didn't love the truth. Okay, wait a minute. What about me? I was raised in this. It was just handed to me. I just got it. If I don't really love it, how can God tell that pagan, you didn't love the truth and you never found it? That denominational person, you didn't love the truth so you never saw it. But you, United Pentecostal, your parents were saved and you didn't really love it either, but you were lucky. You went to a children's revival, you got saved. So you, you get to go to heaven. No, I think at some point in everybody's life, even if you're raising this, If you don't love it, if you're not passionate about it, if you're not willing to sacrifice for it, if you're not willing to commit, if you don't get a zeal, then if you don't have a love, something will come along and convince you to go another way. That's why we have people that inexplicably have gone another way. We gotta love it. It says, if you don't, God will send delusion. Now, I I believe where there's life, there's hope. I'm going to always pray unless God tells me not to. But think about it this way. If God sends you a delusion, who's going to undelude you? Who's going to send you revelation? If you say, hey, that new revelation is from God. If you think that, who's going to show you it's deception? That's a scary place to be in. No matter how much we fail, no matter if we are a prodigal, no matter if we sin, no matter if we backslide, somehow contain a respect and a love for the truth because there will be a way back. And let's hold on to truth. Let's love it. Let's desire it. Let's preach it. Let's teach it. Let's study it. Let's read it. Let's meditate upon it. Let's put it in our system. We've got to be eaten up with the Word. We've got to be eaten up with the Spirit. We've got to be eaten up with the move of God, consumed by zeal. And then finally, proclaim the truth. If you don't proclaim it, you're not going to keep it. But if you proclaim it, it becomes part of your DNA. You know, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world before I was general superintendent. And I'll just tell you, there's a very large access challenge nation that I won't mention that I traveled before and after being superintendent. It's now increasingly difficult. I tell the story in my little book to the end of the earth, so I'm not going to name the place. But I can tell you story after story. We have multiplied thousands of believers. It humbles me. I remember the last time I went there, I had to cancel the trip, prior trip because of, I got word. We have leaders high up in government that get word of what's going on. And they told me, don't come, it's dangerous. So a year later, I checked with the leaders by indirect means, said, is it okay to come? This is what they said, it's very humbling. They said, you're a man of God. You will pray and God will tell you if it's okay to come. And if he tells you it's okay to come, we'll be there. And I'm thinking... If I miss it, I could get arrested and kicked out of the country. I'm an American citizen. I'll probably be okay. But if they believe my word and show up and get arrested, it's on me. I got to hear from God. That was a humbling thought. I did go. And I won't tell you all the things they did because it's better not to know. But they rented a facility that we had control of. They posted five lookouts on the property. They boarded up the windows and, and the doors so we could they, nobody could see us, nobody could hear us. We could worship, we could pray. And there's several trips like this. I remember one of those trips, we had leaders from all over the country. I'll tell you how humbling this is. These are leaders of house churches, leaders of cities, 
And here be a young couple in their 30s. They're professional, have a master's degree, doctorate uh, in professional careers, teachers, educators. And yet they're, they're putting everything at risk. And they're leaders of house church. There's one young woman, single young woman, maybe 30-something years old. And they introduced me. She's the leader of 50 house churches in her city. So she's probably a district superintendent. I don't, I don't know if you can be that, but she was something like that. So all these people from all over the country, their various provinces, and, and they showed me the provinces they hadn't yet reached and who they were going to send to reach every province. And this is where we're having to meet in secret. And they said, would you pray for us? We want, we're going to come up person by person, couple by couple, and we want you to lay your hands on and pray for each leader. Now, think about this. We had to arrive secretly over a couple hours time, just straggling into church and be quiet. And uh, I had to baptize people in my hotel bathtub. And we walked out on the river, baptized, went, hiked up a mountain to a stream and baptized. We had to be very careful about everything. So every time these people come to church, they're risking getting arrested, imprisoned, fined, losing their careers. And then they told me a lot of these young adults they're such a housing shorts. They live with their parents. Their parents are unbelievers, spirit worshipers. And there'll be a little altar in their home where people, they, their parents sacrifice to the idols and the spirits. So when they go home, they battle evil spirits. So how would you like it if you were a Pentecostal preacher or a bishop? Every time you go to church, you're risking getting arrested. Every time you go home, you have to face evil spirits. So wouldn't you think their prayers are like, God, why this? Why that? God, deliver us. God, save us. God, get us out of here. But here they had two prayer requests. They said, number one, pray for our witness. Because if we witness to the wrong person, we get arrested. We have to know who to witness to. Pray that we will witness with boldness and not be intimidated. But we just have to have discerning of spirits to know the right person to witness to. And then they said, the second thing, pray for miracle signs and wonders. Because we can't convert people by intellectual argument. We can't convert people from atheism or communism or spirit worship just by presenting an intellectual message. We must have power. When we pray, they must feel the presence of God. When we pray, they must get healed. Demons must be cast out. So they said, pray for our boldness of witness and pray for signs to accompany our witness. Two prayer requests. It was so humbling that I would pray for them. But then I remembered Acts 4. Does that resonate to you? Acts 4, 29. After the apostles were beaten up, arrested, and they were finally released and threatened. Don't preach this message anymore. Acts 4, 29. Here's their prayer. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. They were praying for boldness of witness and signs to accompany. That's apostolic. That's happening in our day. What about us? The zeal of your house has eaten me up. Let's stand. I've got more. I was in Fiji last year, 50th anniversary. 50 years ago, no apostolic people. Now 12,000 constituents, over 1% of the population of the country. 193 received the Holy Ghost. You can see some pictures. 25 were healed. One of those pictures in the middle there's a woman who was blind, received her sight. Another picture, a woman who was deaf, received her hearing. Right here, and you heard the NAM service, but I was privileged to do two dedications in one day in June in New Jersey. See caucus, the pastor sold his house to buy a church, invested his house savings because there was a little dilapidated parsonage part next to the church. And between contributors and the loan fund, the Hindus were going to buy that church, but instead the United Pentecostal Church bought that church. But it was a sacrifice of the pastor and his friends and UPCI loan fund. And then Hamilton, New Jersey, Brother Wyatt, our district superintendent, he, it was a miracle. Again, it was UPCI, Church in a Day, coming on side in, in north central Jersey where it's so hard to start a church and so hard to get a building. But in one day, God gave us two beautiful buildings that would seat hundreds of people. I'm saying there's apostolic revival. 
but we've got to be consumed by zeal. I'm giving the altar appeal right now. Here's what I'm asking. Number one, stand firmly. Number two, serve faithfully. Number three, go zealously. I'm not just preaching to preachers. Who will go to your family? Would you close your eyes if God is speaking to you, if you are being consumed by zeal, not just stirred, not just touched, but God is calling somebody to win your family. God is calling somebody to win your friends. God is calling somebody to win your school, your job, your community. And you can't be still. You can't not do it. You can't not teach a Bible study. You can't not win a soul. I'm talking to young people. I'm talking to faithful saints. You, it's got to be more than a Pentecostal tradition. It's got to be more than a church culture. It's not got to be more than good singing. It's got to be more than good preaching. Who's going to win and disciple a soul? And now I'm preaching to pastors. Who will go to the next town? Who will go to the next town? It can't be a trendy idea. It can't be just signing up to say you did it. You gotta be consumed. That town is gonna be lost. My town has a witness, but where's the witness of the next town? I can't not go. I can't not pray. I'm, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. That next town is calling a vision somebody from Macedonia come over and help us come over and help us and who brother Howell who brother Hundley will go to the next access challenge nation it's not for the faint of heart it's not for the missionary that just likes to be at general conference but somebody has got to go to that access challenge nation. Somebody's gotta go to that unreached people group that nobody has ever gone to, that's never heard the name of Jesus. Yes, their country has a witness, but that language group does not have a witness. That tribe has no witness. That city has no witness. I need somebody with zeal. You're consumed by zeal. You're eaten up. Oh, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. The zeal of your house. I can't not do it. A fire is shut up in my bones. I love the truth. I believe the truth. I'm going to proclaim the truth all across the building. Let's pray.
know, just like I'm feeling, that we are being consumed by zeal. If you need to know your next step, go to upci.org. Go and teach a Bible study. Go and learn more about global missions or more about North American missions. Go get involved in what God is doing in the local level. God wants to use you to change your family, to rewrite your history, to reach your neighbor, your coworker, the person at your school. Why don't we take a moment right now and thank God for his word and then take the next step to go and follow his word. God, I thank you so much for truth. We're going to stand for truth. We're going to believe truth. And God, we're going to love and proclaim truth. Thank you so much for your word today. Help us to be consumed by zeal. Thank you for all of those that are watching here tonight. I pray that they're never, ever the same. The testimonies and the stories of your glory that are going to come out of what happened tonight is going to be phenomenal. And for that, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Go and follow the will of God. Stand for truth, love truth, and proclaim truth. Go to upci.org to learn how you can be involved in the story of his kingdom coming in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much once again for joining us at General Conference 2023. God bless you.